the Lord, hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord, hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord, hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to members, friends, visitors alike. We are glad that you have come out of the wind and the chill to gather with us this morning in the presence of our God, our God who is ever present where two or more are gathered in his name as Jesus our Lord has taught us. In our midst we find the love, the grace, the mercy and the forgiveness of God. It is here that we are reminded that God is at work in our lives and we are dependent upon God. For those watching at home, we are the Federated Church of Ashland, located at 118 Main Street, right across from the town hall. We gather every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. to give thanks to the God who blesses us all so richly. We hope that you will join us. Because of the love shown us in Jesus Christ, our Lord, we choose to be the all our welcome here church. We welcome those present and those watching at home. Good morning to everybody. I'm Brett Walker. I'm going to be your liturgist for this day. And before we get started on the formal parts of the service here, I would just like to address some housekeeping. If anybody's new, uh, welcome, first of all. And second of all, the, if you need to use the restrooms, they're to my right, to your left, down this little hallway right here. You can find them using the laminated map card that's in the pew in front of you. If you want a large print bulletin, please make yourself known now, and uh, somebody will bring one to you. If you have any announcements, that's it. No, it doesn't say it. Good, good job, though. Diligence, Melanie. Diligence. Uh, <laughs> if, you, um, if you have any announcements, please hold them till the end of services. You can come sit in the front row, and Pastor Ryan Eddie will recognize you at that time. Uh, please remember to join us for a period of fellowship following this service in, um, in the uh, parlor just behind us. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So with that said, Raman, I see you back there. Would you ring the bell and let the people of Ashland know we're here to worship? And now please join me in a time of personal reflection. Thank you very much. Now, if you're able, I'd ask that you please stand and join me for the, today's call to worship, which you're going to find in your bulletin. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has a house and the swallow a nest. In the, in the presence, presence of, of the Lord of hosts, O God, God and King. King. Happy are they who dwell in the house of the Lord. They will always praise you. Happy, Happy are, are the people whose strength is in the Lord, whose, whose hearts are set on the pilgrim's way. As is our custom, let us greet those around us with the sign of Christ's peace.
as long as we're standing, I'd ask that you bring your attention back to the bulletin. And please join me in the opening prayer that's found on the bottom left. Lord, we come before you in all humility, aware that we have followed other gods, ashamed of that we have strayed from your path. Lead us back to righteousness and the ways of truth and justice that we may be made holy. In your gracious love, have mercy on us, for we are sinners. We make our prayer with confidence in the love and mercy of you, O Lord, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is going to be 2 Timothy 4, uh, 4, verses 6 through 8, and then jump to 16 through 18. If you choose to join me, please do so. I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through through me the message might be for, fully proclaimed and all Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thus ends the first reading. The gospel this morning comes from the gospel of Luke. Chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to God. I'd like to give uh, recognition this morning. I have a, a, a blue ribbon that says number one or first on it. And this recognition is to the greatest sinner in the room. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> no one's hand has shot up. Now, is that the case because in the gospel this morning I just read about two different people who came into the temple? The first was one who presumed to be righteous. He was not a thief. He was not a rogue. He was not an adulterer. He worships in the temple. He gives appropriate amounts of money and stewardship collection. And so as he came to church, he felt rather righteous. So is that why no hands went up? Because you're all in that category. You look around and you say, well, I'm not like 
them. Now, I wondered if, on the other hand, if I asked the question, who would you point to <laughs> as the greatest sinner in the room? That might be a different story. So since no one is raising their hand, I'm going to put the thing on myself. You know, we often think of sin solely in terms of the way in which we treat one another. I would assume that there is no one here that has intentionally done harm to anyone else this past week. I would presume that there are no rogues or thieves or adulterers who are here in our presence this morning. As I look out, I recognize almost every face here as someone who worked hard yesterday at the church fair. And so I would presume that there aren't too many sinners here this morning. And yet, if we only think of sin in terms of the way we treat one another, I think we miss something of great importance. And that is that sin is not just the way we treat one another. Sin is also a word that we use to characterize our relationship with God, our Creator. If we leave God solely in the position of the one who judges our behavior toward our fellow man, we miss the point that we exist, we live in the presence of a God who looked out across all of his creation and then he made humanity. As I read last week, as we worshiped outside from the book of Genesis, he saved the best for last. After separating the light from the darkness, after separating the earth from the sea, after creating all the plants and all the animals, he made humanity. You and I are a creation of God. And the question always asked is, why did God make me? Why did God make us? Growing up as a Roman Catholic, there was a book called the Catechism. And we would study the Catechism and we would learn the questions and we would learn the answers. And the first question in every Catechism was, why did God make me? And the answer always was, God made me to know, love, and serve him in this world and in the next. Lots of wisdom in that answer. And so the question before us all is, who among us has served God this past week? Who among us has been righteous in our relationship with our Creator. The God who calls each of us to holiness. Would God call us to holiness if it were not possible for us to be holy? Would God have made us imperfect and then expected us to become perfect? Rather, God perfected us when he made us. And God made us to be in relationship with him. <clears throat> the gospel of these two men who come into the temple from Luke talks about two people who are describing their relationship with God. Now the first one, the righteous man, the one who is grateful that he is not like that bad tax collector, he views righteousness as someone who has obeyed all of the laws of Judaism. 
All of the laws and all of the tenets and all of the principles that are put down in the book of Leviticus, he has fulfilled every one. And for him, as he stands there in the temple in the presence of the Most Holy, he claims his rightful place, essentially. I am righteous, he is essentially saying, because I have obeyed the law. And then you have this other fellow. First of all, as a tax collector, he most likely worked for the Romans or if not the Romans were King Herod, who was not a well-liked man. Tax collectors were presumed to be dishonest. Tax collectors were the ones who probably took a portion of what you paid in taxes, put some in their own purse, and the rest went in the coffers of the king or the Roman governor. They were the ones who made sure that they extracted every tax penny that was owed and had the full authority of the government to make sure that you paid your taxes. And so if you didn't, you were kicked out of your house. Imagine the IRS personified in one person. That's the person that Jesus is talking about here. And he does not come into the temple to claim any righteousness whatsoever. As he stands before God, his only prayer is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. What is his relationship with God at that moment? Do you and I identify with him, or do we more likely identify with the righteous man? The one who has done all of the right things, all of the proper things, has abided by all of the terms of the law, by all appearances, is deserving of God's blessing. And yet the reality is that each of us is not deserving of God's blessing. Regardless of how good or how bad we have treated our neighbor. Because the question is, how well have we been in our relationship with God? You know, I, I use that title, sin is a three-letter word in the bulletin, because I wanted to introduce two other three-letter words. One is you, Y-O-U. And the other one is God, G-O-D. We mistake sin as only a descriptive term in our relationships with one another. But sin also exists in our relationship with God, our Creator. How many of us have sat in the presence of God this week and reflected upon the kind of person we have become. How many of us have sat in the presence of God and asked God for help to be a better person? How many of us have sat in the presence of God and just savored the moment? Or have we lived our lives in such a way that we've considered all of the other things on our to-do list far more pressing and important than our relationship with God? You know, the world at large has lots of good people in it. The world at large has lots of people who don't use the title Christian and who treat their neighbors well. People who sacrifice a great deal on behalf of others. And yet they do it without knowledge and awareness of the God who created them. The Old Testament is filled with references where God essentially says, I will be your God 
and you will be my people. How many of us here have recognized our relationship with God? Certainly I as a minister pause in those moments and I feel terribly unworthy to be called to preach the good news. What a privilege I have to be here to stand before you to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. It's a privilege I have not earned. It's an honor I do not deserve. Because in my heart of hearts, I know my faults and my failings. I am not here because I am an example of virtuousness and holiness. And yet God called me. But God just did not only call me, he called you and you and you and you. And he called you not to do good, of course that's part of it, but he called you to love you. He called you to be all that you can be, to point a phrase. Sin is the term we use to describe a broken relationship between us and our God. How often in each week when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Why do we need God's forgiveness? Why don't we just simply forgive one another and then we don't need any forgiveness from above? Or do we? Do we need forgiveness from God or only forgiveness from our brother or sister whom we have harmed or whom we have neglected? Sin describes our relationship with God and God's mercy and the love and the blood of Jesus Christ is our salvation. There is much to be said to be that tax collector who comes into the presence of the temple unworthy. His head is bowed down. He dare not look up to the heavens, it says. He claims no right, no privilege. His only prayer is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. How many times have we failed to recognize that loving our neighbor is not all there is? The bargain includes loving the God who loves us, being in relationship with the God who created you special and unique. Evil is what we use to describe the presence of sin in the world, but sin is the word we use to describe our broken relationship with our God. Now, lest there are those who think that because they have not harmed their neighbor, that they are righteous. I'd like to expand that a little bit too when we talk about sin and evil. Because while no one here has harmed anyone this past week, we are part of a global community. We are living under the current a title of humanity. We are part of a larger human race. And while we think we have lived our lives in the confines of the town of Ashland, and live comfortably under the roof of the Federated Church, we are deluding ourselves in terms of our relationship with the larger world. While most people here might acknowledge global warming, how many of us have done what we can to minimize our use of fossil fuels? 
while we look with horror and see the violence committed around the world, how many of, many of us have ever cast a vote in an election or called our representatives in Congress about the military industrial complex that is here in the US that produces much of the weaponry that's used around the world the causes or is the basis for the wars and the violence that exist. While Americans make great profits on the corporations that produce the weapons that are sold worldwide. How many of us have been mindful of the amount of energy it takes to produce the food that we've become accustomed to eating? If you read the article that I put in last month's Ashland Local News, I talked about water and how much water it takes to produce a single hamburger. We in the U.S. love our meat. We love our beef. And yet our beef cattle produce more methane gas, you know how, <laughs> that pollutes our atmosphere but we feel entitled to our beef. Yes. You and I impact the world around us whether we want to acknowledge it or not. It may not be our intention, but if we choose to sit in ignorance of the way in which we impact our world, we too are certainly contributing to it. Because I won't be here the next two weeks, next Sunday, Reverend, John Paul Sidner is going to be preaching, and the following Sunday, we're going to be fortunate to have one of the families from Family Promise is going to tell their story. So because I won't be here the next two weeks before the election, while I can't endorse a candidate, and I can't tell you who to vote for, I certainly would encourage you to look at the issues and the rhetoric that has impacted us all and the cloud that it has placed upon us as a nation. And I would encourage you to think of sin when you go into the ballot box. And I would encourage you to think about political systems and political ideologies and political speech that does harm to our world and harm to humanity especially political speak that uses labels to treat people badly, to speak of people in derogatory terms, that uses political labels to justify hate and sexism and discrimination and religious intolerance. <coughs> You and I carry a lot of burdens by virtue of our faith in Jesus Christ. We must struggle with our relationship with our God in whom we often have a broken relationship. And we must recognize that the sin that exists between us and our neighbor is not merely the neighbor who lives next door to us. You and I are called to something greater. You and I are witnesses to the presence of God in this world. What is the world that God would want us to have? What is the nature of the relationship God would want us to have with one another? And then as we live our lives, let us accept the struggle. My message is not meant to be one to discourage you but rather to lift you up to recognize that you are holy because God has made you. You are called because God has called you. You are precious in God's eyes because Jesus Christ died for you. Be aware that the message of Jesus Christ is one to transform us that sets us apart to live in a relationship with the God of love and mercy 
to be part of one great human family. And when we fail, let us come before our God and recognize our failure. And let us make the prayer done by the tax collector when we fail. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. A friend we have in Jesus, number 526. Please be seated. Let us begin our time of prayer by lifting up those whose names appear in our prayer list, that together we can call upon our God on their behalf. We pray for Ken and Sue Sullivan, who are victims of uh, fire. Uh, I believe these are the granddaughter and son-in-law of Henry. Is that right, Henry? Donna. Oh, Donna, okay, Donna. sorry, Donna. Um, let's pray for Brian Richards, for Jane Woodward, Mariana Freeman, June Stevens, Ruth Norton, Elaine McKee, Muriel Mayotte, Boxoon Han, Lois Cotton, Dottie Klaus, Alice Bixby, and all our service men and women around the world. And I now invite you to speak aloud the names of any particular persons or situations that have come to your attention so that together we might share in your concern or gratitude and also lift them to God in prayer. Sue? Yes, our young neighbor next door, PJ, is battling cancer. Okay, PJ in need of healing. Margo? The Adams is, uh, Don is in the hospital. For Don Adams, okay, and his and the family. Yes, yes Angela. Don, Don, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Don is for breast cancer. 
Donna, Judy. Donna, Donna, who has breast cancer and needs healing. Sorry, Janet, to call you <laughs> Angela. Sorry. Anyone else? Melanie. For Paul. For Paul, who needs our prayers. Pam. For Rachel and Jan. For Rachel and Rachel and Jan. Lord, let us become of one mind and heart as we pray for the needs and concerns of our brothers and sisters who struggle around us, whether within our families and among our friends, or for our neighbors and community, or for those separated from us by many miles across our world. We continue to lift up the people of Syria and especially the city of Aleppo, where government forces are indiscriminately bombing and killing innocent civilians and children within that city and region. And for the civilians in and around the city of Mosul in Iraq, under the brutal control of ISIS, which is now under siege. May they be spared from further harm and violence. We pray once more for our nation in the midst of a presidential election where the seeds of racism, sexism, religious intolerance, and isolationism are nourished, and where women, immigrants, the LGBT community, people of color, other religions, and the disabled have been debased and scapegoated in an appeal for votes. May our public discourse and civic conversation shift towards the values upon which our nation was founded and the better angels which our faith in Jesus Christ inspires in our hearts and minds towards all people. May this election be an opportunity for people of goodwill to vote in such a way to repudiate and reject the words and values which are in opposition to those preached by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray for the sick, those with serious illnesses, some of which are life-threatening, for the mentally ill, those struggling with addictions, and those struggling with the loss of independence as they age. May God's healing presence restore health and wholeness, strength and peace of mind and heart. For this we pray. We pray for our church in the aftermath of our annual fair in the final week of our pumpkin patch, where so many members and friends have worked tirelessly out of love for this church and its continuing mission. Bless this church, Lord, that we may give witness to your presence here in our midst. For this we pray. We pray in the silence of our hearts for the needs which we carry there. Let us pray as Jesus our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. be seated. We're all mindful that not only is the hard work necessary to keep our church going, but people's generosity. And so as we pass the plates this morning, I would encourage you to be as generous as you are able. Yesterday was a busy day. 
uh, for those of you who are teenagers, some of you were at the, uh, the bonfire last night. The bonfire was a combination of, of uh, uh, a bonfire and a, uh, a concert, a rock band concert by one of the young uh, teen bands from the high school. It was, it was a nice affair, even though the weather was miserable. Uh, we had a very small pile of wood this year. The reason the pile of wood was small is because we were concerned about the drought and we were concerned about the uh, setting the woods on fire. So the pile was only about eight feet high and only about eight feet wide. Uh, and all the straw burned beautifully. The wood would not burn. <laughs> the drought got broken and it broke the fire in terms of the wood and the wood is still sitting in the middle of the parking lot. So if you're wondering why the bonfire wood is still sitting in the middle of the parking lot, at the, at the community center, that's why. We've got to get it out of there. It would not burn. But the kids had a good time anyway. Uh, I was a little worked up over, over yesterday, and so about 4 o'clock in the morning, I had a cup of coffee and a plate of warmed over lima beans because I didn't have supper last night. Now, you probably don't care why I had lima beans at 4 o'clock in the morning. But I also got on my email, and I had an email from the kids, uh, from the Cedar Street Kids Club. And the Cedar Street Kids Club and I basically came to an agreement at 4 o'clock in the morning as to, as to the lease of the daycare in the basement uh, and uh, a general order of events that are going to take place in order to, uh, to try and be online with the daycare center at, uh, on December 1st. This is going to be a busy morning uh, for some of us, okay? Because one of the requests that Todd Curlett, Todd is, uh, grew up in this church, is that we clean out the chairs and tables on the, uh, the uh, I don't know what we call it, this is the Mandela Room is all I know it, okay? Uh, and move them all into the center classroom uh, so that they can begin to re reconstruct that side of the, of the building. Uh, they're going to lift the rugs, they're going to paint everything, they're going to put in a new ceiling, new lights. It's a major renovation of the space down there to turn it into a real daycare center for the kids. But there's a schedule of December 1 that, that's going to require us to, to make some things happen. We now have a collapsed awning out front. We have no idea the condition of the awning but we need to fix the awning and we also need as many of you as can to come down to the basement after service this morning to carry a couple of chairs and a table out. You know, if, if, if a bunch of us get to do it, it won't take long to, to, to move the stuff. There's a number of chairs, there's a number of tables. We can probably make it happen in about 15 or 20 minutes. So I'm asking all of you, uh, whoever is able to please come into the basement to help us move move tables and chairs, as well as go upstairs and drink coffee, as well as go into the parlor and buy jewelry and mittens and things, as well as to do all the other things that we have to do this morning. In any event, uh, I, will, uh, I will probably be signing the contract with uh, the kids, uh, Cedar Street Kids Club either Monday or Tuesday. Todd may not be aware yet that I, I accepted his last proposal. Uh, at, uh, at four o'clock in the morning, and he'll probably be a little stunned that I was up. But, but be that as it may, uh, we, we have a good contract. Uh, it's a three-year contract, uh, extendable in another three years beyond that. Uh, and uh, we're getting commercial grade payment for the space downstairs. This is not a, uh, a, a uh, meaningless rental that we're receiving. It's a substantial chunk of money. Uh, and I'll have it all laid out for everybody uh, by the end of uh, this coming week, or this week, I guess. Um, in any event, thank you very much. Glenn. I'm sorry, Glenn, I can't hear that. We're going to move them down the corridor in the basement into the long classroom. We're going to store them there, and then we're going to try and sell them either on eBay or on Craigslist. <clears throat> we haven't figured out yet what to do with them. And I may as well tell you the other, the other good news. Uh, a large dumpster is coming on Wednesday or Thursday, and a lot of the stuff that is in the little classrooms on this side of the basement, uh, the stuff that has no future use is going to go into the dumpster. The stuff that needs to be saved is going to go down in the classroom. 
and we'll have until the next family promise to figure out what to do with all that stuff and where to put it. Uh, any other questions? So you need volunteers to come in for a cleanup of the space and next weekend. Next weekend. So on Saturday, I'm going to put out a, a call for volunteers for next Saturday to just clean out the other the other side of the basement. Any other questions? The basement will not look like the basement does now once this is all done. It will have a fresh floor. We'll have uh, vinyl, hardwood uh, simulated vinyl. It'll have some rugs. It'll be painted. It'll have a new ceiling. It'll have new lighting. It's, it's going to be a different basement. <coughs> Thank you very much. If there are no more announcements, let us stand and hold hands with those in our vicinity. We have a few more outliers. Come on, grab a hand. Lord our God, we hold the hands of our brothers and sisters, fellow travelers on a journey of faith to which you have called each of us. We ask your blessing upon all who are gathered here. May we be inspired by your presence that we may shine forth your light into a world in darkness. We ask your blessing upon us all, that we may go forth confident in your presence in our life, facing whatever trials are ahead without fear, confident that we will be victorious, for we are ca called by Jesus Christ. May God bless all those present and all who we meet today, God our creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. Amen. Our community sing is the first verse of Go Make of All Disciples. from 